For lo, the fall of ocean's wall, space mocked and time outrun, and round the world the thought of all is as the thought of one. With the rise of the telegraph in the 1830s, dominating communication on land, this left the ocean as the next great communicative barrier. Some attempted to simply shorten the distance between Atlantic telegraph stations, but one chose to close the gap altogether. Cyrus Westfield worked through failure after failure, until finally managing to connect America to Europe by means of the first transatlantic submarine cable. These advancements not only improved communication across the Atlantic, but also had economic impacts, reducing information frictions and improving trade. While the technology has advanced over time, underwater cables like this one are still in heavy use even today. The journey of the first transatlantic cable began with a problem which had existed since the beginning of time. As put by Daniel Zittram, prior to the telegraph, messages could travel only as fast as the people who were conveying them. But in the 1830s, this all began to change. Because of a simple yet complex invention using electric signals to convey information through wires, inventors like Samuel Morse were able to establish one of the first instant messaging systems, the telegraph. Although advancements had been made, messages from America to Britain were still transported by boat, usually taking around two weeks to deliver. A peace treaty ending the War of 1812, called the Treaty of Ghent, was signed in Belgium on December 24, 1814. With the end of the war and a signed treaty came relative peace that would lead America and Britain to later partner together and create the first transatlantic telegraph cable. Originally, America's closest telegraph station to Europe was in Nova Scotia, but people like Bishop J.T. Bullock suggested connecting the U.S. cable to St. John's, Newfoundland. In the words of Bullock himself, by establishing it as the American telegraphic station, news could be communicated to the whole American continent, 48 hours, at least, sooner by any other route. A man named Frederick Gisborne took on this challenge and even laid the first ocean cable in North America connecting Prince Edward Island to New Brunswick before he lost funding. Gisborne went $50,000 in debt, and in order for him to complete the project, he headed to New York in search of further capital. In the meantime, multiple major discoveries had been made. First was the discovery of the Telegraph Plateau, which was a 1,600 mile long piece of flat ground along the ocean bed which reached nearly all the way between Newfoundland and Ireland. They also discovered a powerful insulator called Gutta Percha, which was used to make the cable itself. Both of these discoveries were crucial for the development of a transatlantic telegraph cable. But who would be intrepid enough to pursue such an endeavor? Cyrus Westfield was a successful businessman who had the funds to support Gisborne's venture. While considering the idea, Field realized that in finishing this line across Newfoundland, they would be laying the groundwork for a future transatlantic cable. The idea that you could run a cable between England and America just seemed too fanciful. Uh, 2,000 odd miles it would need to cover, and it was regarded as uh, science fiction, if you like. Regardless of what many thought, Field wrote to Samuel Morse and Matthew Morey, who was the head of America's Naval Observatory at the time, and they both believed that a transatlantic cable was possible. It was during this time that Morey revealed the Telegraph Plateau's discovery, further convincing Field to take on the challenge. Field's first step was to finish Gisborne's original telegraph. Later, he would recount some of the struggles this difficult venture brought. It was a very pretty plan on paper. It was easy to draw a line from one point to the other, making no account of the forests and mountains and swamps and rivers and gulfs that lay in our way. Following the Newfoundland landline's completion, in 1855 they began an underwater cable between Cape Ray and Cape North. After laying about two miles, they found themselves trapped in a violent windstorm, and fearing for their lives, they cut the cable. This obstacle would be a precursor to many future roadblocks to come. Returning the next summer, they were able to complete the project and succeeded in connecting St. John's to America's telegraph line. Next, Field formed the Atlantic Telegraph Company, and after visiting America and Britain, he gained funding and ships for the next treacherous voyage. On August 8, 1857, the Niagara and the Agamemnon set sail from Valencia, Ireland towards Heart's Content, Newfoundland, to lay the first transatlantic cable. 
Great excitement was in the air, and with anticipation, the venture began. However, only a few days later, the vessel was slammed by a wave, and the cable snapped, sinking to the bottom of the ocean. They tried again the following June, going opposite ways starting at the halfway mark, but like the previous voyage, it was unsuccessful. In 1858, yet another attempt was made towards the cable's completion, this time succeeding without much of an incident. Field was heralded as a hero, celebrations rang out on both sides of the Atlantic, but success only lasted so long, and about a month later, the cable went quiet. The Transatlantic Telegraph Company was left grappling for any way to fix it, even raising funds for another cable, but it was to no avail. Some saw this cable as unnecessary and too expensive for its unsatisfactory results, saying things like, 10 days bring us the mails from Europe. What need is there for the scraps of news in 10 minutes? Others began putting forth accusations that this is all merely an elaborate scheme and a hoax to get the money of unsuspecting investors. They would eventually be proven wrong later on when the cable was successful, but at the time, rumors were highly circulated. Then the Civil War began, and the project of the transatlantic cable faded into the background. Field and the Atlantic Telegraph Company worked throughout the war to gain funds and create a better cable for the next attempt so that following the war, they would be ready. As written by a friend of Cyrus Fields, the work had to be commenced afresh. His faith in its ultimate success was still unshaken, his confidence unbounded, and his determination to carry it to completion as firm as ever. In 1865, the Great Eastern, the largest ship in the world, set out with the cable on board. But once again, it snapped and fell to the bottom of the ocean. They spent days trying to retrieve it through various grappling methods, but their attempts were unsuccessful. Field promptly began preparations for yet another attempt. Having the right ship, cable, and funding, they set out once more. Starting from Valencia, Ireland, and traveling to Heart's Content, Newfoundland, the Great Eastern made the journey which would mark the transatlantic cable's success down in history. It took Cyrus Field 12 years to complete the project, and he had to cross the Atlantic 64 times. Uh, the cost was eight times what he had originally estimated, uh, but it paid off for him. He became a rich man. As some of the first messages sent along the transatlantic cable, the Queen and President exchanged words of encouragement to mark the occasion. Queen Victoria expressed her congrats to the United States and described how she hoped the cable would strengthen their bond, to which Andrew Johnson responded acknowledging her message and agreeing with its sentiments. As word of the cable's completion reached the people, large celebrations occurred and they had good reason for their elation. The transatlantic cable itself allowed for greater commerce between Britain and America by reducing information frictions, allowing for more accurate data to be shared in almost real time. And that's something that I also saw in my study that um, better information reduced the risk and therefore brought um, the two countries uh, closer to each other in terms of prices. This is with my work with the, with the transatlantic cable, there is lots of parallels to the internet today. So I think we can learn a lot by looking to economic history uh, in order to try to understand the world today. But the biggest short-term impact of this cable would be that communications of which otherwise would have taken around two weeks to reach Britain could now arrive in little to no time at all. Humanity was able to communicate like never before in history. Following what would go on to be known by some as the greatest enterprise ever undertaken by man, more underwater cables were laid. An example would be the Pacific Cable, which was completed in 1902 by the Commercial Pacific Cable Company, about a decade after Field's death. He had considered creating this cable himself, but it lacked interest at the time, and therefore wasn't successful. Through the years, those cables have improved, leading to even more communicative advancements, like transatlantic telephone cables. For example, by 2022, Google plans to lay a cable from New York to the UK and Spain. Today, contrary to what many would assume, 95% of information conveyed across the Atlantic is transmitted by submarine cable. A technology developed over 100 years ago is still the primary form of transatlantic communication, even today and with the development of a literal and figurative connection between Britain and the U.S., relations have been further cemented in their solidarity.